sitting in for Diane this evening for Mid American Gardener. Welcome. We have a great panel here for us tonight to answer all your gardening questions. So call in and uh, get in the queue. Uh, we're going to start out this evening with our first guest is Rhonda, and she's got an email to share with us. Yeah, I'm Rhonda Furry. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, and I cover Fulton, Mason, Peoria, and Tazewell counties right in the middle of the state. And my expertise is are more in horticulture, landscape horticulture, and uh, I like to do house plants. So I picked a couple of house plants today for my email questions. Uh, the first one here is about a palm and their uh, palm, a very large palm that you'll see in the picture here that has they've had for about a year and it thrived on their patio last summer, but they moved it inside for the winter. Uh, they actually potted it into a concrete planter and started feeding it in the spring and it has started to turn brown and wondering if that uh, plant is, uh, if they're overfeeding it or if it's a concrete plant or what's really going on. So I would say that a couple of things to think about. One would be that the most common way people have problems with house plants is if they overwater them. And then the second thing would be it's a palm and so I would really be concerned about the light that's in there. And, and it's really hard to grow a palm actually indoors. Mm -hmm. So probably I would think that it would be the light condition. Yeah. I've always had problems with spider mites with trying to grow palms inside that they seem to get it pretty instantaneously. They do great out on the patio mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. the summer, but then bam. Yeah, yeah, so uh, it, it's it's probably a temporary plan yeah. at best. Yeah. Enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rhonda. Uh -huh. Shane, what do you have for us? I'm uh, Shane Coulter from Country Arbor's Nursery and, and Culture Nurseries in Anarg, Illinois. I am a fifth generation nurseryman, so over the most of my life, I've been answering questions about why plants died, what the plant is, and where should I put this. And I can probably answer some similar questions here as well. And we've got a, a great question uh, today that somebody sent in a picture, and it says, wondering if I could identify these little ball slash things that I found in the soil while pruning. And, and I knew what it was immediately, but I passed it around the office to see who could get it. And everybody knew that you know what it was, but they weren't quite sure. But it turns out, it's, it, I'm pretty sure it's the top of acorns. So I think it's all the, the, some squirrels have done a little work and taken the acorns and hidden them and then kept the caps in a little storage area. So it's not gonna hurt anything. It's, uh, it'll just compost into the ground eventually. And I imagine that there's other piles somewhere around the yard with a lot more acorns, uh, acorn tops and the acorns are all over your yard and that's what the squirrels are running back and forth. So I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Uh, so it won't hurt anything. Great, thanks Shane. Yeah. Jennifer, what did you bring for us? Um, hi, I'm Jennifer Fishburn. I'm a University of Illinois Extension horticulture educator serving Sagamon, Menard, and Logan counties. Um, I like to talk about herbs and vegetables um, and invasive plants. And tonight, um, I brought show and tell. Um, this is what this plant looks like right now. It still has the green leaves attached to it, um, as many of our invasives do at this time of year. This is a cow repair and it's coming up in a flower bed. It's a couple feet tall at this point. They do grow very aggressively. Um, and one of the ways that I know that this is a calorie pair is, um, well, first of all, an invasive is it came up in the middle of a flower bed where it wasn't, wasn't planted. Um, the other thing is, is they will develop thorns on them. Um, and this is a plant that you, at this time of year, would be very easy to remove from, your, from any of your flower beds or, or plantings. Um, simply with a, a little bit of a tug or dig it out, um, it should be very easy to remove. Um, so that's what I brought tonight. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, next, we're gonna go into the Did You Know segment on rhubarb. A native plant of China, rhubarb was grown and traded for medicinal purposes as early as the 16th century. Rhubarb gained popularity as a food and vegetable source by the 19th century. Oh, thanks a lot. Let's go to the phones. Uh, line two, we have a question on Christmas cactus. Go ahead, caller. Yeah, hello. My name is uh, Rossi Cario, and I have a question. Uh, please, uh, I have a cactus plant since two years and has not been blooming yet. Uh, could you tell me what's, uh, wrong, what's wrong with it? Or what can I do with it? Please? Yeah, um, there's a couple of 
different plants that are called holiday cactus. And so the Christmas cactus, if that's truly the one that you have, has rounded kind of scalloped edges, whereas a Thanksgiving mm -hmm. cactus has more pointed edges. Thanksgiving cactus is much easier to force into blooming. So if you really have the Christmas cactus that has the round edges, that's a pretty difficult one to get uh, to, to bring into blooming. It, it usually is gonna need um, kind of a cold treatment. A lot of times a Thanksgiving cactus will just bloom once it's next to the colder window. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, it, you'll need to give it a, a colder treatment and uh, not, not freeze it obviously, right. but just kind of put it in a, a basement or a garage and, and then um, the longer uh, days, or, or sorry, the longer mm -hmm. nights uh, will also help it to initiate flower buds. So it, it's a hard plant to get to go. I make mine the last thing I bring in, and actually I'm pretty mm. late on bringing all my plants in right now, but um, I noticed that my Thanksgiving cactus has buds on it mm -hmm. already. The mm -hmm. Christmas one doesn't, but um, yeah, it pays to be forgetful with those to, <laughs> to yeah. some extent. I think you said one of the keys there was to bring it outside. Mm -hmm. A lot of people just leave it in the house the whole time. So if you bring those outside, we put them in the shade under a tree and treat them like a, like a house plant or a plant, mm -hmm. and that warms them up and gets them outside. And then when they come back into a colder environment, that, that makes that cold period the, a little easier when it's been in a warm outside. And a lot of people forget to bring, that they can bring those plants outside right. and they prefer, and that's where their native habitat is, is to be outside. The only time I ever had one of those Thanksgiving cactus, Christmas cactus bloom without putting them outside, it was in a perfect south facing window yeah. that just. That most people don't have. That most people don't have, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, but yeah. Thanksgiving is much easier, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. much easier. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to, uh, Line four, we've got a question on mulching, switching gears a little bit. Yeah, turn it down, turn it down. Yes, uh, thank you, Jennifer, for filling in for Diane tonight, and thank you for taking my call. Uh, yesterday, while the weather was nice, I blew a lot of leaves off of the yard, mm -hmm. and I, I blew them up on uh, some yellow lilies that are around the garage, uh, probably 12 to 14 inches deep and I uh, also was going to do some knockout roses that are going to be cut back as well as uh, another bush that's up alongside the house and since this is the first time I've ever uh, the first time I've ever done it with leaves I just want to make sure I don't smother them <laughs> and uh, I would like to have some kind of an answer if, if at all possible. Well, I'll start that one out. Um, I typically mulch my leaves with a, a lawnmower before mm -hmm. I put them onto a flower bed, um, breaks them up a little bit, particularly if you have oak leaves, uh, the water tends to, to just run off of those. And mm -hmm. um, sometimes if you make your layers too uh, deep, they can compact and actually cause a little bit more problem than they would be benefit. But mm -hmm. um, they are a great mulch and they are a great way to um, overwinter your roses, um, but you might try m mulching them first. What else wants to add to yeah, that? If you, if you don't grind them, they tend to blow away. Mm -hmm. You know, the bigger mm -hmm. leaves have too much surface area and right. maybe they compact, but, but tomorrow's wind, you know, winds like we have when they're 30 miles an hour, you may not have anything there unless it's <laughs> yeah. a little more <laughs> composted down. Right. If, uh, or if they don't mat down If they don't mat the down. Rain. And grinding mm -hmm. them in the lawnmower or a shredder or some kind seems to be a much better way of doing mm -hmm. it. Otherwise, your neighbor will have your protection. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks caller. Um, line three, Elaine has a question on elderberries. Hello. Hello, go ahead. Okay, um, I have a question about elderberries. I come from New York State originally and have lived out here for 12 years and I miss my elderberries. Is it something that does grow here? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. <laughs> it, okay. You need plenty of space, though. Mm -hmm. they, cure, they get big, and they get there quickly. So, and yeah. they get lots of berries. Yeah, elderberry grow <laughs> really well here, actually. I love elderberries. We, I grew up in central Illinois, in, in Canton area, actually, and, and we had a big elderberry bush. Like you said, we had a lot of space, and my mom would make jelly and jams and such. So, yeah, they grow really well here. Okay, so get time to get yourself some elderberry. elderberry. Uh, trees over the winter. Uh, next, line five, Jay has a question on the pinky winky uh, hydrangea, I assume. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my name is Jay, but it's okay, I'll, I'll answer to Jay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a bush called pinky winky, I guess you're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a form of hydrangea, right? Mm -hmm. 
it's got cone shaped flowers yeah. and they, they're white and then they turn kind of pink and then kind of a burgundy. Mm-hmm. Okay, they bloom beautifully this year, but the bush is getting really big. Can I cut that back like now? Yeah, it wouldn't, bloom. it wouldn't hurt to trim it back. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I'm amazed how many people don't like the flowers, you know, the dried flower. Look, I have people come in all the time say they yeah. don't like it. And to me, it's one of the huh. nicest things. But I will say that the, the plants have grown so well this year that the flowers are so large that mm-hmm. it might be a snow issue. So actually mm-hmm. trimming back the heavy tips back wouldn't be a bad idea, but y- you could do it now. It, we we do it all the time, and we do some trimming when you're not supposed to just because of space issues. Sure. But on the paniculata hydrangeas, which that is, we take the flowers off all the time and tighten up the head a little bit without mm-hmm. any problem, without affecting the growth and the blooms for next year. So okay, well, it, can, it can definitely be done as, as proven. Okay. Thanks for the tip. Thank you. We're going to go um, another round of uh, show and tells and emails here. Rhonda, what was your next Yeah, so question? I had a, an, another house plant, actually. This one is titled Rusty Fern, and they had a, a fern, which I'm thinking is a Boston fern, that um, they've, the uh, first fern they ever had look growing, actually, and they noticed that the fronds had a really rusty appearance. Just wondering what's causing it. It gets a little sun, but it says mostly shade, and it's in a east-facing front porch. Uh, so a couple of things without, of course, seeing it uh, um, in person, a couple of things to think about. One would be when you move those plants outdoors, they sometimes will sunburn. And so it could be uh, sunburned leaves, or we were talking earlier that could also be uh, the spores underneath, which is the reproductive structure, sometimes will uh, kind of uh, rub off and and can uh, cause that kind of rusty uh, look. Uh, So it kind of looks like bumps on the underside of the leaves. Okay, thanks Rhonda. Shane, you had an interesting show and tell we were talking yeah, so about before the show. We have, uh, everybody knows about bulbs and, and it's something that we, a lot of people forget until in spring when they see all these beautiful bulbs and they think, oh, I'd love to have those, but you, mm-hmm. you have to do it in the fall. And, and some people are really good at planting lots of bulbs and then there's the people that want, but they don't want to have to drill every single one, but they're used to planting perennials or a shrub. And this, this is a new way of packi- packaging them that makes it a little easier to plant. And it's just a disc, and inside this disc are five different bulbs, and they come in all different patterns. There are daffodils, and some are all tulips, and uh, some of them are mixed. Some are color patterns that they've mixed together that they think would be appealing. And all you do is simply dig a hole, and you dig it five or six inches deep, and you drop this in. And they say it doesn't matter if you drop it this way or this way, that the bulbs will find their way to the surface or the plant. And it just makes it easier if you just want splashes of color around the yard without having to do a big fancy bulb area. And, I, and we've found that our customers really do like it. Now we have some people that don't know and they tear them open and <laughs> plant them just like regular bulbs. It's a little more expensive way of doing it, but this really does make it nice. And then you can also, if you can store them properly in the spring, you can put them in a pot and they grow in a nice little decorative pot as well in a one gallon pot. So this is a I've been very successful. It presents very well from a retail garden center standpoint, but from a, a homeowner, it's really nice to be able to just dig one hole, drop something in, and have a splash of color. And as we all know, everything needs to be quicker and faster, and people find this this is. That's interesting. So, yeah, it's, it's, again, people that plant tulips say, oh, I can plant. What's so hard about planting a tulip? Right. But then there's others that struggle with doing it, and this is, just makes it simpler. It might be the hand-holding that they need to get, Absolutely. To get into Whatever the world Whatever it takes bulbs, to get plants right? out there, if we have to put it in some a pretty pot or something, Right. we need to do it. <laughs> Great, thanks Shane. Jennifer, what did, what's your next show and tell? Uh, tonight I brought a knockout rose with me and this one is called Blushing. Um, I just find it so incredible that on today's date in the middle of November, um, I can go out and find a rose blooming and actually has flower buds still on it. And I have seen uh, um, knockouts bloom all the way up till Thanksgiving and even just a little bit later. They're a very tough rose. They they seem to do just fine with this cool weather. Um, and they are one that particularly I like. Um, I know they're overused in the landscape, but I like them because um, they seem to be pretty fuss free. Um, mm-hmm. You do have to cut them back in the spring, the dead, but um, otherwise they, they tend to do their own thing with not a lot of, lot of fuss over them. So um, they just need a good full sun location and some nice rich soil and they'll do great. But I'm just excited at this time of year. We see so many things in most of Illinois still blooming. 
Thanks, mm -hmm. Jennifer. Yeah. You also pointed out to me earlier that it has a scent, and I it does. that rose came out of my own yard, and I have never stopped to smell the roses um, in my I own yard. I hadn't noticed that many knockouts have, but this one does have a little bit the of a fragrance. The yellow is, I, I, I challenge a yellow to any scented, any kind of rose. It is the most fragrant rose mm. we sell mm. in the nursery. It's wow. only the yellow. Only the other the ones are, are much milder, but the yellow is amazing. Mm. Just not a pretty yellow, in my opinion. Yeah, but it, I just it, never thought. I just great. never thought to try and yeah. it, that that one would have a fragrance. So thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to our uh, Mid American Gardener quiz on wisteria this evening. The wisteria in Sierra Madre is said to be the world's largest flowering plant. How many blossoms does it produce yearly? A fifteen thousand. B, 150,000, C, 1,500,000, D, 2,500,000. C, 1,500,000. The wisteria produces over one and a half million blooms and has been growing for over 100 years. Thanks for that. Uh, we're gonna go back to the phone lines. In line six, John has a question on castor beans. Go ahead, John. Yeah, Jennifer, Hi. I planted uh, castor beans this year to have some to put in the mole runs next year, and uh, they are 19 feet tall, and uh, the trunk is 6 inches in di diameter. How am I going to get rid of those? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Big it's been a banner year for <laughs> castor beans. You're, you are the second person to tell me that they had giant castor bean plants in their yard. Um, I imagine they'll eventually come out of the ground pretty easily once they die back. Um, anyone else have any thoughts Well, I'm on sure that? it's very similar to many of the other annuals like sunflowers, I and mean, they will die back. Um, and if they don't, you know, get a shovel in the spring, they should work themselves out fairly easily. Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna, the plant's gonna die. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it, yeah, it'll come out. <laughs> maybe just not now. Yeah, no, it's not right now. It's if you know any kids, you maybe get them out there. I remember having sword fights with uh, sunflower stalks mm. growing up. So don't let them get the beans. Yeah, don't yeah. Eat not the, the beans. beans. Yeah. <laughs> Castor beans are poisonous. Yes, yeah, very poisonous. Great point. Okay, let's go back to our phone lines. Line two, Shirley has a question on lilies of the valley. Go ahead, Shirley. Uh, hi, I'm glad you took my call. Um, I managed to get three little lilies of the valley started this summer. And all, all that came up was like two green leaves, and it didn't get any bigger. Now, I just took all my flowers out of the garden, and those lily of the valley leaves were all brown, and they were dead. Mm -hmm. My question is, the root system that's left underneath, will they come back in the summer, next summer? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The short answer is yes, they will, they will come back. He should, and Lily of the Valley is generally pretty vigorous. And in 10 years, Aggressive. you will have enough yes. to share with everybody <laughs> my, in the neighborhood. My grandmother used to call them lilies of the alley. She <laughs> hated them because they grew so vigorously. Yeah. It's actually one of my absolutely favorite flowers, and so I just love, the, again, the fragrance mm -hmm. of the Lily of the Valley. Uh, but it's one of those, the first year when I plant them, mm -hmm. they seem to kind of sleep a little bit, and then they'll leap the next year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I Great. think you'll be fine. Okay, let's get a couple more calls in here. Line three, Peggy has a question on blueberries. Hi, my question is, what is the trick to grow blueberries in Illinois? <laughs> and is wet moisture, is there a certain type that I need to get? Well, the, the, the wet, first dry? The first step is to know your soil pH. That's that's the most important things with blueberries. Um, most pe most places in Illinois, particularly Central Illinois, we struggle with blueberries because our pH is too high. They need a very acidic soil. So the very first step that you'll have to do is amend that soil um, to lower that pH. Maybe even test it again um, a year later and make sure you have the right pH uh, to get started on it. Um, that's your first hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, if you just buy one to plant it, it may do okay, but you it, it will struggle. It, it will not usually do well in our high pH soils at all. Yeah, and our, our customers struggle with two other main things. And one, it likes a really sandy soil. Mm -hmm. And our heavy soils of Illinois are absolutely heavy. not right for it. That's why you find them on the coast of the Michigan side of the lake and those kind of areas. So you need to add quite a bit of sand or stuff to 
to aerate that. And then the other thing is rabbits adore them. Mm -hmm. So it's, yes. it's, there is no more favorite plant in the garden besides bl before blueberries. They mm -hmm. will go come to your blueberries before the snow even hits. So if you leave them out in the open, you will not have any blueberries. They yeah. have to be caged or even repellents are, are don't do it. They, they really need to be caged because uh, they will eat all of them. If you have a big field of them, it's not a big deal. You can give a couple up. But if you've got one in your yard, you mm -hmm. won't if you don't protect it. I've, I've, I've had good luck growing them in, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go I was on. gonna say the, the advantage for me is I live in Mason County mm. in a sand, uh, and so I have pretty yeah. uh, low pH soils already, and it's very sandy, so yes. I actually can grow blueberries in, in yeah. central Illinois pretty well. I gave up trying to grow them in the ground, so I did them in a container. Oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. There's a couple of varieties that are yeah, pot crops small. that are yeah. really good. Top for hat is one that only gets to be about a foot tall. Yeah, mm -hmm. it does pretty and well. The new jelly belly. Yeah, yeah. the mm -hmm. new varieties. But top mm -hmm. hat's been a traditional good pot growing one. You can keep it off the ground from the rabbits. Yeah. Another alternative: Have you guys grown honeyberry? No. Mm -mm. That's one that it's mm -hmm. a honeysuckle that it, um, it's a type of honeysuckle, but it looks like a an oval shaped blueberry, and it doesn't have the issues with pH here. Mm -hmm. So we've done pretty well with that one yeah. too. Okay, well, let's go back to the phone lines. We've got, uh, Bob has a question on petunias in winter. Uh, yes, uh, my wife has uh, two hanging baskets with uh, yellow petunias in them. Mm -hmm. They're really doing well, and we was wondering if we can bring them inside and they will keep over the winter, and if we do, should we change the, the soil they're in to a new soil for, the, for bringing them in the house? That's what I love about this show. You know, I've been doing it 20 years. I don't think I've ever had a petunia in the house or anybody ask me about it. You know, I, that's a that's actually a good question. Do you, any of you have any experience with bringing a petunia? That's one plant that's one I've, never I've never even tried talked either. about. I've never tried it. I, I don't see why you couldn't, of course, try it. You can try anything. Um, I would think you would need to cut it back um, because it's going to struggle inside. So mm -hmm. you get rid of some of that extra foliage, cut it back. Um, Watch the watering. Well, yeah. Maybe one over water. Keep it on the light. I actually have petunias growing in my office right now, <laughs> <laughs> and they're actually in an arrow garden. But um, they grow really well, and and um, and it's not. Of course, it does have some supplemental lighting. But I think if he cuts it back, he, he yeah. might be okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back. Uh, we've got another question on castor beans. Line five, Ron. Yeah, I've got castor bean seed pods. And I'm trying to get them to pop open. How, is there any way you can tell me how to do it? I think it's just whether they get dry enough, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, they're probably too green. Could yeah, be they're too probably green. too green. Yeah. Give them a chance. Yeah, they'll dry out here. It's been an unusual year this year. Mm. To say Around the, least, the Midwest, right? so <laughs> things aren't popping when they're supposed to pop. But they'll do it on their own. Yeah, they should. We even cut them and bring them in and put them in the window and just let them dry sure. out in the winter, too. Well, and a lot of people cut them and remove them because of the poison yeah. factor, too. Yeah, we, we collect the seeds. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, you got to keep the, the seeds away from people. Yes, you exactly. You don't want it mixed anywhere near that. So. Exactly. Okay, well, thanks for that. We have a another question um, on Shane's show and tell. Oh, boy. You're on the spot, Shane. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. Hello? Hello. Go ahead. Um Shane was talking about the daffodils or showed us the daffodils in the package mm -hmm. that we can plant. Um, and I was wondering if that would be an effective barrier for the squirrels because whenever we plant bulbs of any kind, um, the squirrels have a tendency to dig them up and eat them. And I wondered if that packaging would keep the squirrels away from them. Well, I've never thought of that as a marketing technique, but I, <laughs> I, I don't think it would, honestly, mm -hmm. though they probably would get through this just as quickly as they would mm -hmm. the soil. But uh, it would not be a bad idea for them to come up with a paper product that's treated with some repellent that, oh, yeah. that goes on there uh, and is pre-treated for, for squirrel. I think, I think you and I can share the <laughs> residual <laughs> money from that new invention you just said. We heard it first <laughs> on the program. That's a really not a bad idea, but I don't think it's going to... Yeah, it's going to protect them at all. One of the things I do suggest is you could try to put chicken wire over the bulbs when you plant them, and that sometimes will deter them from being able mm -hmm. to get to the bulbs. Yeah. They can't poultry poultry netting is what it's called. But if you have um, deer in the area, too, even the most meticulous poultry netting won't keep them away. <laughs> I have a friend that did that, and the deer came by after the plants came up. 
Okay, we've got time for about one more question. Uh, Janet has a question online too about hens and chicks. Yes, we have some some uh, pots with hen and chicks in them, and they've done very well during the summertime. But now I don't know what to do with them uh, during the winter time. Should I bring them in, or should I leave them outside? Uh, what do I need to do with them? Well, I think because they're in a container, I wouldn't want them to freeze right. solid. So I've actually had some success with bringing, I had a hens and chicks, actually I had them in my dad's old leather boot mm -hmm. <laughs> that I planted them in. And I t put them in the garage and just overwintered them in the garage and then came, brought them back out in the spring and they actually did pretty well. I did it last year by accident just because we ran out of time to plant them and they did mm -hmm. fine in the garage. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's... Uh, about it for the phone calls and I thank you all for watching tonight and we had a lot of great questions a lot of great show and tell and uh, thank you all for watching